Good morning. It's uh, Sunday, June 28th. We're going to be teaching and preaching from the book of Matthew today. If you want to turn to chapter 9, verse 35, and we'll begin in chapter 9, verse 35. Um, we're doing well at our house, um, still, still wearing masks and um, gloves when we go to the grocery store, or we're doing a lot of pickup from the curbside. Um, I hope that you're continuing to wear masks and following uh, the best practices and the best recommendations um, that we are receiving from the CDC so that not only do we keep ourselves safe, but we help to uh, keep the most vulnerable around us safe. Uh, my kids are really um, enjoying being out of school. Um, yesterday we had an opportunity to go out on my dad's fishing boat at the reservoir. Um, Lindsay, uh, Lily, and Lincoln and I, and we even took our dog Chloe, and we had a really nice time. Um, got maybe a little too much sun. Um, okay, are you there, Matthew 9? I need to begin by telling you that discipleship costs something. Um, true religion, there's a price to it. To follow Jesus in his mission, and we're going to look at a, quote, missionary text or discourse from the Lord this morning in Matthew 9 and 10. To be a mission missionary or to be on mission or to be a disciple is uncomfortable. Okay, let me stop right there. When I say uncomfortable, I don't mean that your life has to be lived in sadness because of the suffering in the world. When I say uncomfortable, I don't mean that you need to find something to be upset about every day. I don't mean that. When I say uncomfortable, I don't mean that you can't have nice things that you like and cherish and value. When I say uncomfortable, what I mean is that our faith, our discipleship, our following of what Jesus taught, our doing what Jesus did, will make us at odds most of the time with the world around us. And that is an uncomfortable place to live. So when Jesus calls us to discipleship and calls us to mission on this Sunday um, in this gospel, he's saying, I want you to be aware. Don't think that if you get into situations that are uncomfortable or people don't like you because you are preaching the gospel. I just want you to know, I, I, I mentioned it to you beforehand. Or if you get into um, um uh, family struggles or struggles at work or struggles at church because of um, things that, that Jesus taught. He says, I just want you to know that that's going to happen anyway. And that is uncomfortable. And that is the life that we lean into. Our mission, Jesus is going to show us, is defined, or we find our mission by our attentiveness to the suffering around us. Again, that doesn't mean every day is lived in sadness, that doesn't mean we live in hopelessness, but our mission in the world, if we teach what Jesus taught and do what Jesus did, our mission in the world is to be attentive to the whispers of the Spirit, to the teachings of the Scripture, into the suffering of the people around us to the suffering of the world around us, to the suffering of the creation around us, which is suffering and toiling in vain and crying out uh, to be redeemed, just like you and I long and cry out to have bodies that are fully redeemed, to have no more aches and pains, to have no more sin, to have no more shame, to have no more guilt. So it is a life lived with uncomfortableness. Verse 35, let's get to it. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the 
good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Notice that Jesus, his speech is proclaiming good news. He's speaking something, but yet he's also healing every disease and sickness. Hands, right? So there's speech and there's action, and they're equally intertwined. When he saw the crowds in verse 36, he had compassion on them because they were, check this out, you need to read it, harassed and helpless. Jesus saw the crowds and he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus is referencing Ezekiel again, where, he's, where Ezekiel says, you got bad shepherds. You got people that, that use people for gain in leadership, and these are bad shepherds. In order to have those who are harassed and helpless, you have to have somebody doing the harassing. And when Jesus is proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, he is saying to those who are harassed and helpless that you are fortunate in that you will be comforted. You are fortunate in my kingdom in that you will be first. You are blessed in my kingdom when you mourn because I will take care of comforting you. He gives that speech that the harassers are in the wrong. People that create policies to make people helpless and dependent are wrong. They're wrong. And Jesus is saying the good news of the kingdom is that if you're last here, you will be first in my kingdom. And you have bad shepherds, and it is not your fault. And then he said to the disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. The workers, the missionaries that Jesus is talking about, are to look at those who are harassed and helpless and to speak to them the speech of the good news, which is they matter. They are uh, made in the image of God. They are beloved by God. Those who society mistreats, those who the sins of society weigh down upon, those who the, the systematic oppression in societies, both in the past, now, and in the future, the folks that bear the brunt of that, the harassed and the helpless, those who are sheep, but they have bad shepherds, so much so that you could say they have no shepherd. Those are first in Jesus' kingdom. And not so good news to those who are doing the harassing to those who are making the helpless. So in verse 10, um, I'm, excuse me, the good, speaking the good news of the kingdom and then using our hands, our, our money, our bodies, our power to um, heal, to bring health and healing into people's lives. Now, today, verse 10, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. I'm going to skip their names, um, but all 12 are listed here of the men that start in the Jewish group, but then by the end of Matthew, um, the first preachers of the resurrection become women, and the movement has gone to the Gentiles, which is you and uh, I. Verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Right, Go to the Jewish folks first, just a starting place. The rest we'll take care of later. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. And so I want you to know that if you will lean in to the uncomfortable situations of the world, the places where people are harassed and helpless, the places where you find 
folks on the bottom of society, if you will lean into those places, if you will get to know those people made in the image of God, you will find, if you go, you're sent. I mean, we're all clear about being sent. It doesn't always mean you go. And so I'm telling you that you're sent, and I'm asking you to go. You will be given power to stand in the way between life and death. Your speech will bind people up. Your, your speech will heal broken hearts. The kindness from your hands and from the power that you have in your lives will, will be like refreshing water to those who are thirsty. You have the power to do that if you'll go. You have freely received, church. Freely give. If we are focused on just maintaining the status quo and securing our comfort in every aspect of our life and keeping ourselves distant from the trials and tribulations of the world, uh, keeping ourselves distant from the suffering of our neighbors, keeping ourselves distant from feeling any empathy or pain that those around us might be feeling. Um, that's not the way of Jesus. That's not teaching what he taught. That's not doing what he did. He taught the good news of the kingdom, which is the day that things are turned upside down, the great reversal, the first or last and the last or first. The weeping will rejoice. The dry will bring forth water and the deserts will bloom. The ghost land, the valley of the bones, gets knit back together into bodies. And you and I speak that and then we do it in this world now with our own hands, with our own power. He gave them authority. He gave them power. If you are not experiencing new life, if you are experiencing the old ho-hum, the doldrums of life, if you feel stuck, I want to encourage you to go look for where people are helpless and harassed, words of Jesus, and get involved. Freely you have received, freely you give. Verse 9, do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff. For the worker is worth his keep. So in this sending, Jesus sends the, the, his disciples without much. Take very little, and he mentions some things. Take very little. For the worker is worth his keep, meaning when you go do the work of preaching, when you go do the work of, of speaking into people's lives, when you go do the work of, of bringing health into, into lives and into situations, you're worth getting um, your life, uh, the needs of your own life cared for. Um, we especially discuss this in terms of vocational um, ministers, um, vocational pastors, or, or missionaries, people who do that for a living. Um, they're, they're not in, interested in amassing great wealth or to, to take all of their things, um, and to store up all these things for themselves, but rather take very little because where you're working, where you're ministering, that, and Jesus is going to call it a home or a town, or that place, um, is uh, is going to give you your key. Verse 11, Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Jesus is saying, go with very little, 
with your speech and your pronouncement of the new world to come and with your actions of doing the healing. And when you come to a town, a home or a house, Jesus says, and you are received with hospitality, great. Um, if you are received and people want to provide for you so that you might stay and minister there, great. But he's saying, if you go and the words that you bring, the words of the kingdom, not other words, not, not words of trying to self, um, not, you know, minister, trying to self-actualize or minister, trying to make everything about themselves or um, someone who is wanting to create um, um, things that, that aren't about the kingdom. Um, but rather, when you bring the message of the kingdom, the first will be last, and it's about here. And you bring your your labor. Um, when you when you spend your own body and your own resources to stand in the way between life and death in order to bring health now to people who are harassed and helpless. When you do that, and and people are not hospitable to you. They don't receive you. Jesus is saying, it's not, it's not on the one who sent. It's on the home or the town that is unbelieving. And he says, shake the dust off your feet. That reference to shaking the dust off your feet, that is meant to be understood like, like even the dust, like whatever, whatever happened there, whatever... Um, problems there were, whoever said what, whoever did what, in that place where you were not well received with hospitality, um, let it go. Let it go so completely, meaning it's not your responsibility anymore. Turn it over to the Lord. It's his responsibility. Let it go so completely that you, when you leave, you don't even bring any dust on your sandals or your shoes from that place. Shake it off so that you can leave completely. And Jesus, in that shaking the dust off, means that you, you don't, you don't have to defend yourself um, tooth and nail. Uh, we don't, re you don't retaliate. Um, you just say, okay, um, I'm not going to subject myself to this type of harm. Um, so I'm going to go somewhere where uh, people do want to receive the message of the kingdom and who do want to live the life of discipleship. And so it's a breaking and it's a freeing to move on. It's an escape and it's an opportunity to further the mission in a place that the gospel will be accepted. And he says, Jesus, in verse 15, Truly I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Um, the prophets tell us that the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was that they were inhospitable, that they were uh, overfed and lazy, and they did not care for others. And Jesus is referencing that and saying, um, receive the gospel from those who are sent or you are just setting up your own your own judgment verse 16 it will be like this it'll be like this Jesus says it'll be uncomfortable I'm sending you out like sheep um, sheep among wolves that's a little uncomfortable therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves smart and innocent be on your guard because you'll be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues on my account you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles but when they arrest you do not worry about what to say or how to say it at that time you will be given what to say for it will not be you speaking but the spirit of your father speaking through you and Jesus says, it'll be like this sometimes. 
Brother will be betray brother to death, and, fa and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stand firm, stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. We see that it will off that the the message of peace and reconciliation and love for those who do not want peace, who do not want reconciliation or love, for them they will respond with crazy making. They will respond with anxiety. They will try to get others anxious. They will say things that aren't true. They will betray one another. All because the message of the gospel was not received. And so you can tell your own heart and what's going on with it and the direction you should go by how you respond to the message of Jesus Christ. That he is, has sent us to attend to where there is suffering around us. This week, I have, you know, we've been talking a lot about justice and injustice. This week, I have just searched through a lot um, of church denominations in, in the U.S. and seeing if they have any, any statements or comments or official positions um, on the, uh, the protests and the, the rage and the disgust and, and the violence um, that we're seeing. Um, and uh, I, just quit, I, I just quit making, um, I just stopped making the list, but because it's long, I just want to mention a few. Um, the leaders of the Presbyterian Church in America made a statement. Um, the Presbyterian Church USA made a statement. Uh, United Methodist conferences and bishops have made a statement. The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America has released a statement. Um, even, even the Southern Baptist Convention um, has released a statement. And they all are speaking with their speech that Black Lives Matter and that the Black Lives Matter movement is part of the gospel work in our day and in our age. It is to oppose state violence. It is to value the black body in all spaces of society. It is to value the, the black experience in America. It is to say that we stand against racism we stand against structural and systematic oppression. And we stand for unity and equality and friendship. And we will not be divided based on race. And this is the kicker. And we've let it go for too long. And we are ashamed. We've ignored it. For too long. We've ignored the place of suffering. We've ignored those who are harassed and helpless for too long. And it is to our shame, to our guilt, to our condemnation, and to our judgment. We do not want to be like Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment by resisting the er, and being inhospitable to the movement and the people of God. And so... Discipleship is uncomfortable because you lose your life in order to gain it. And the way of Jesus to teach what he taught and do what he did causes divisions for those who don't want to be a part of that way. And so as 
pastor, I can't permit us to have comfortable religion because our mission is to be attentive to the suffering of others. We preach release and freedom to the victims, and we preach change and judgment to leaders who use people for gain and who make the victims with their policies. I cannot permit us to have comfortable religion. In this context, in our day, this week, this month, this year, in our age, in our generation, to preach the gospel is also to say that black lives matter or all lives can't matter until black lives matter. We must press into the unrest because that's where God is on the move. Instead of seeing all of these things going on as troubling, rather change your perspective to see all these things going on as the potential and the hope for transformation of our society to one where the values of the kingdom can be lived out for all peoples. And your pastor will continue to call you to your baptism vows. This one in particular, when you were baptized, you vowed to accept freedom and power God gives you. Wasn't that just in our text? To accept the power that God gives you? Your hands, your body, your finances, your power. You can use it to make life around you better for others. To accept freedom and power God gives you, and you said yes. To resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. And friends, we have an opportunity to resist the evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves by extricating and untangling and uncoupling our society from policies and laws and systems and structures that oppress people of color. That's the work of the gospel in 2020. Finally, I cannot permit us to have comfortable religion because we have been sent to do the healing with our own hands, our own mouths, with our actions, the speech. We are to protect and to promote with the power that we have. And that is the cost. That is losing your life in order to to gain it. And whatever you lose will be double in the kingdom. And whatever you try to hold on to uh, will turn into rot and dust and grief in the place that should have been the good news in your mouth in the place that power should have sprung out in your heart. Will you follow me in the ways that I follow Jesus? I love you. I speak challenge to you. I'm asking for your commitment. And I'm asking for you to see the work of the Spirit in all the turmoil that is around us in our age right now, this very day.